Welcome to the Payroll Podcast, the show that explores the latest insights and innovations in the world of payroll. Hello and welcome back to the Payroll Podcast. My name is Nick Day, CEO at JGA Recruitment Group, and we're specialist payroll recruiters. And today I am joined by Gary Henderson, who's manager in the National Minimum Wage Team with the People Advisory Services for Ernst and Young. And today is all going to be about national minimum wage. Before we jump into that, let me give you some context as to who Gary is, because we've got a real specialist on the show for you today. Gary started his professional life with the HMRC at the tender age of just 16. He started in the debt collection call centre part of the business while studying for history and broadcast journalism, which will did actually have some relevancy a little bit later on at university. But like everyone who ends up making a career in the civil service, uh, or even in payroll, to be fair, Gary never intended to make his career in the civil service. But here we are, 2015. At the time, Gary then joined the National Minimum Wage Department as an investigator. And you know what? He absolutely loved it. Within a year, Gary was promoted to more complex cases. And after four years, he was involved in uh, investigations and and casework and took advantage of his university studies in journalism to move into promoting compliance, where he took on the employer education and engagement portfolio at the HMRC. This included presenting national minimum wage live uh, webinars to over 20,000 employers every year, publishing online guidance, running projects, uh, many of those with outside organizations, basically the carrot to the stick of the usual enforcement work from the HMRC. Gary actually became known, and you may know him already as this, as the voice of national minimum wage. And that's how he likes to be known, uh, listeners. So by all means, if you see him out and about, that's that's what you need to call him when you do. And you'll find out why during the course of this show. But ultimately, it was such an uh, amazing role uh, for Gary. He really enjoyed it. But in 2022, he decided that he probably took the role as far as he could. So he decided to leave the civil service and joined EY to become part of their dedicated national minimum wage team. And I've invited him today to join me to talk about his work because he's now helping clients with their national minimum wage compliance. He's helping with national minimum wage strategy and he's helping clients navigate their way through national minimum wage investigations. National minimum wage is a hot topic for power professionals. It's going to be a really a uh, good deep dive into national minimum wage. So, Gary, welcome to the show. How are you doing today? What an introduction that was. <laughs> Thank you very much. I'll need to get you down to speak at my funeral when the day eventually comes <laughs> as well. That was uh, that was something else. But no, I'm really happy to be here. I've been looking forward to this for a wee while, Nick. So, yeah, really glad you've uh, you've made the time to have me on. That is very rare. I get the voice of national minimum wage on the show, right? This is, <laughs> this is good stuff. But let's start with the first question I ask all my guests, which is this. What does the word payroll mean to you? Yeah, I've, uh, I've listened to quite a few episodes uh, and I was actually trying to think what I would answer to that because the first <laughs> thing that comes to my mind when you talk about payroll is danger. <laughs> because when I've been dealing with payroll in the past with uh, my work at HMRC's National Minimum Wage Team and now um, the payroll people are always the people uh, that we dealt with uh, as part of the investigations. They were always the ones where we had to kind of maybe deliver the bad news that, that something was going wrong when it came to the National Minimum Wage or where those kind of uh, technical issues or trips or pitfalls would always be exposed. So my very limited kind of dealing with the payroll side of the world was always kind of fraught with uh, risk and danger. Well, that's good. Well, it's, it's nice to have a slightly different perspective on it, to be fair. Uh, you're not someone who's fallen into payroll, but you've mm. kind of fallen into national minimum wage. You start with the HMRC at the tender age of 16, as I said. So tell the listeners a little bit about your journey into national minimum wage. And, and I also, you said to me that you absolutely loved it. So tell me a little bit more about that as well. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. So um, where would I come from? The the city I was uh, kind of brought up in called East Kilbride, just outside Glasgow, had one of the biggest tax offices, one of the biggest HMRC offices uh, in the entire country. So it was one of those uh, towns where you knew somebody or you were related to somebody or you did work for HMRC, yeah. you worked in the tax office. So my mum, my dad, my sister, my brother-in-law were all civil servants uh, at one point before they retired. So my wife always uh, lets me know how interesting the family dinners were. Uh, when that, <laughs> that was a topic of conversation, but I uh, went in there at 16, straight into the kind of fire of debt management call centre, phoning people who have underpaid self-assessment tax credits and and trying to claw back money from them. So you can imagine how much fun that was at 16 years old, first job I've ever had. Um, But yeah, I was there kind of right through university, as you mentioned, and then 2015 came, finished university, was looking at a kind of full-time job at that point and was lucky enough I got picked up on a a kind of recruitment drive, a 
across HMRC and happened to just end up in the National Minimum Wage Department. Now, at that time, did not have a clue about National Minimum Wage. Knew it was a rate, knew nothing else about it. Didn't even know HMRC were responsible for enforcing it or anything like that. But they had grown that department from when I went in. I think it was about 40 or 50 people nationwide. It was all very low-fi. It was all very low-tech, the investigations that they were doing. And then it exploded over that kind of 2015, 2016 period when I uh, got involved. And it was totally different from anything that I'd ever been involved in in HMRC before because there was such a there was such a kind of personal edge to it. It was people's wages. It was people's livelihoods. You were directly dealing with the workers who were complaining. You were directly dealing with the employers. You were kind of the bridge between them. And it was about people's livelihoods and their lives and their wages. So you were kind of stepping away from that almost spreadsheets, numbers, taxes, that sort of side of it. And you were getting a real kind of social um, hit across the back of the head. That was something people always wanted to talk about. It was something people always wanted to hear more about as well. And uh, yeah, it just kind of grabbed us at that point because you were working as an investigator. You were half detective because you were trying to piece people's stories together. You were... Um, interviewing uh, a lot of workers, a lot of employers and that side of things as well. So there was there was just so many facets to it as well. Um, and yeah, really kind of picked it up, really enjoyed my job over that couple of years while I was doing the investigating and kind of were quite happy, you know, staying on the, the national minimum wage bandwagon as long as I could at that point. You've made it sound exciting. It sounds like something out of a spy movie. You've got problem solving, you know, you're, yeah. you're dealing with investigations, but also you're helping people that often are on the on the breadline, right? And th- th- this can make a huge difference to people's lives. And it's make it's important we get it right. We are going to, for, for listeners uh, tuning in at the minute, we are going to di- deep dive into National Minimum Wage. Before we do, obviously you made the transition after a number of years with HMRC. You're now with, with EY. I imagine EY were often on the other side of the table when you were at HMRC. So how's that transition been for you how does it feel now being on the other side of the table looking back at the hmrc and and, and tell me a little bit about how that feels and that experience yeah it's been an interesting one i i thought it was going to be a little bit more difficult and a little bit stranger than it actually has been funnily enough luckily enough laterally when i was uh, there for maybe the last three or four years i was part of the what was called the national minimum wage promoting compliance team which is a fantastic team really really small team as part of the hmrc department um, but we were in charge of all of the kind of employer outreach education webinars and that gave me a completely different kind of understanding of national minimum wage and how it was all working beforehand when you're an investigator you're kind of sat opposite the employer you're kind of taking all of the information from the worker you're the one that's handing out notices and penalties and bills and everything like that. So sometimes they're a little bit more guarded with you and they're a little bit less friendly than you would expect. But then when we were doing the educational side of things, then I really got a a totally kind of different perspective on payroll, first of all, and on employers and on all the challenges that they face in getting things right when it comes to the national minimum wage. And you start finding out that, you know, very, very rarely are they purposefully underpaying people the minimum wage and are getting caught out by all of these kind of technicalities and these pitfalls and slip ups that you know for 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 the love of anything else they they, they would just not realize they they just wouldn't know without us kind of being there to support them and tell them and help them along the way so that really helped and as much as i was getting a, a far better understanding of how employers actually felt about the national minimum wage how they dealt with it what their knowledge levels were as well and where i could kind of fit in in terms of lending support so when yeah 2022 came up and as you mentioned briefly at the start i kind of got to a point where i felt i'd taken that role as far as i could within the confines of working in the civil service hmrc always lots of red tape and everything involved and sometimes you're not able to be as open and as transparent and as as helpful as you maybe want to be with employers and so i started kind of looking about potential other roles and the option to stay in the civil service would likely have been moving away from minimum wage. And, and with that, you're, you're kind of throwing away eight or nine years of, of kind of really useful knowledge and experience. Um, so I started maybe looking a little bit more outward and, and had a couple of great conversations uh, with Jenny Morris, who's the, the head of the National Minimum Wage team. She did a similar jump seven or eight years ago, back in 2015, 2016. And indeed, our entire National Minimum Wage team at EY are all ex-HMRC investigators as well. So 
I suppose there was a lot of kind of trepidation, a lot of fear of the unknown at my end, but having people that had done similar, that were in the same position as me previously, to kind of talk me through that, talk me through the transition and the differences, um, it made life a lot easier. Now, yeah, we are kind of dealing directly with clients, we're supporting clients uh, in their national minimum wage investigations. So it can be a quite quite a bit funny sometimes going back to case workers that you knew and that you dealt with and, you know, yeah. one side of it and you're kind of on the other side of the table now. But, you know, I've had nothing but good and friendly and kind of professional and amicable experiences so far and, and kind of long may that continue. Well, that's good. That's good. Actually, I read one of your, it was funny because listening to that with a, with a LinkedIn piece that I'd read that you'd posted quite recently, about a week ago, so go, uh, a week or so ago, where you said that one of your biggest challenges when you're working for HMRC is that where employers would come to you with specific questions or examples looking for guidance, for a number of reasons potentially outside of your control, you could never actually answer outside of the general signposting, right? But that must have been really frustrating at times. And I'm assuming that's something that's changed now on the other side of the table. I think you put the shackles an hour off. Yeah, hundred percent. That's maybe like maybe a little bit of kind of dramatic <laughs> license from me saying the shackles are off, but that's and and you know what? It, it, it's not a kind of knock on HMRC at all because I know the reasons why they can't do that sure. in a lot of situations. They've got to kind of defend themselves in terms of you know if we're on a webinar and somebody's just very kind of you know diving in with a question on a specific. Um, topic or a specific circumstance and we give a very in-depth answer there might be more to that situation that we don't know at that point and then um, you've got somebody from HMRC you know in those stages given a definitive answer that could come back and be wrong later on so I, I totally understand why they do it but at the same time there would be so many occasions where things would come up circumstances would come up people are looking for some very pointed or very specific advice and you know you can help them and you know you can be useful to them and um, but you're just kind of not in the position to be as open and transparent yeah. as you could be whereas now definitely we're getting right into the kind of nitty-gritty of specific circumstances scenarios situations you know Je jenny often says that she's seen everything uh, come up in the last kind of seven or eight years, every sort of nook and cranny of national minimum wage that you could imagine. But even yesterday on a call, she had something come up that she'd never covered before as well. So it's always, there's just so many different facets and so many different lanes national minimum wage can take you down that it's very difficult to kind of have catch-all guidance that covers everybody and everything. So that's why we're really lucky where we are that we can get into these kind of in-depth conversations yeah, nice. with clients. But let's let's start to dive into that. Well, that's one quick question. The last one I ask you about HMRC, I promise. But we'll go into uh, the, <laughs> yeah. the deep dive bit. That's because on on this show in particular, obviously most of the guests I have are uh, in-house payroll managers, payroll leaders, and so on. And sometimes the HMRC can be uh, a point of frustration, a challenge. You some people love the HMRC, of course they do, but it equally don't at the same time because it can be difficult to get through having uh someone on the, on the show like yourself has been with the hmrc for so long do you think they get a little bit of you know, bad press sometimes what what's the reality of the situation there because yeah. it's it's hard it doesn't always get it, good it, press it, it's such a hard one because over the the last kind of 17 years i've been there the amount of you know properly really talented really bright really hard working people yeah. that are so so good at their job like as I said in my last role, especially within minimum wage promoting compliance, surrounded by so many kind of bright, talented people that genuinely want to help people and want to put things right for people and put them in the best position possible. But you do see, and I see it in LinkedIn and social media and, and you know, hear it from people as well, that the, the customer service side of it, they just find, you know, bits and pieces of it so lacking. And whether that's, you know, a structural thing, whether that's just a, a kind of lack of staffing or lack of funding, which you've got all over the civil service, all sure. over public services and that sort of side of it as well. Um, but yeah, for me, it, it's very difficult to come away with any bad feeling or with any kind of denigrating things to say about the people I've worked with because, you know, I was there for 17 years as well. There was something that kind of kept me there. And when you do work there, some of the, the benefits in terms of the culture, the work-life balance, the flexibility is all absolutely amazing for people as well. So it is a really, really good place to work. I was surrounded by people who, you know, worked very hard and were very good at what they did. But, at the, you know, the same token, I totally get a lot of the frustrations that people have It's got. a big animal, isn't it? That's the thing. Yeah. But it's really encouraging to hear such a positive uh, review of your experience. And uh, you know what? The talented people absolutely work for HMRC. We're going to show that now because you you were there for a long time. You're now with EY. We're, we're going to focus the conversation now on national minimum wage. So what, what are the kind of things that we should be looking out for um, 
in especially in relation to HMRC and animal wage enforcements in particular, we've seen a lot of this on, on social media, people talking about this uh, online. So what are the things we should yeah. be looking out for? It was really interesting with that is, you know, most kind of businesses and most clients that I speak to, you ask them who deals with their national minimum wage and they've never usually got one person that deals mm-hmm. with it. It's kind of split across finance, payroll, HR. So it's always one of these things where maybe the kind of knowledge within businesses um, is lacking slightly just because it's such a niche area um, within the, the structure of the business and they've not got one person who kind of specifically the expert on it. So with HMRC enforcement, just to give the, the background on this for anybody that doesn't know is HMRC enforce the national minimum wage on behalf of what's called the Department for Business Energy and Industrial Strategy, known as BAES. So they enforce it and what they do is they investigate businesses through the year. They do you know, thousands each year. They do that based on complaints that come from workers and ex-workers, but they also do it based on sectors, risk profiling, different kind of geographical areas. They, they look at a number of different ways you know, which would lead to them opening an investigation. And then if they find as part of that investigation that somebody's underpaid the minimum wage, they instruct them to pay back the workers who've been underpaid. But on top of that comes a penalty, which can be up to 200% of their arrears. And also comes with, this is a big kicker that most companies want to avoid, is the public naming side of it. It's one of the only kind of heads of tax, one of the only kind of HMRC tax bracketed things that comes with that public naming warning on the side of it. And companies get named and shamed. And because it's such a social thing and because it's such a hot topic, it always makes the newspapers, it always makes social media and can really be you know, properly damaging uh, for a business's uh, reputation. So that's the kind of background of it. But going on to this year, what we're kind of hearing uh, from the HMRC side of it is that they're expanding. They're always expanding uh, the National Minimum Wage Department. As I said, when I started, there was about 50 there. I think it's closer to 500 now. So wow. the, the numbers, yeah, the, the feet on the ground have expanded so much uh, over the course of the last kind of eight, nine years. And they seem to be concentrating this year a lot on larger businesses. So they have these enforcement teams who look at larger businesses where you've got huge workforces and a lot of the issues and problems come around technicalities. So it's not maybe the kind of historical national minimum wage problem of a hairdresser down the road's got three workers and kind of pays them five pounds an hour to to sweep hair off the floor and make teas and they've been underpaid. It's now looking at multinational huge businesses and looking across entire workforces. So their business and data analytics um, capabilities are increasing every year as well. And that's just given them more insight you know, into these larger businesses. Specifically, we're kind of hearing that they're shifting their approach slightly. Now, they would usually look sectorally at these things. So you would have things like the hospitality industry, you would have the retail industry, and you'd have like things like the manufacturing industry. They would be the kind of main ones we would go back to again and again when I was at HMRC, because that's where all the common failings came about. But what we're hearing this year, and specifically from one area in Belfast at the moment, is that HMRC are looking at a kind of geographical approach to things. So they're picking you know, certain areas around the country, and they're getting in there for kind of sharp, intense enforcement action in that specific area. So what we've kind of ascertained from our work in Belfast and what clients are saying back to us is they're receiving letters that are offering them national minimum wage health checks. So they're being invited forward to speak to HMRC out with an investigation, which is a slightly new tact from HMRC, um, to give them a health check on their minimum wage. But kind of crucially, they're also writing to workers. So they're contacting, I think, there was thousands and thousands of workers in the Belfast area. I think one of the numbers I heard from uh, from another agency was there was 30,000 workers they'd been told in Belfast had been um, contacted. And what the problem is there is HMRC are kind of duty bound in their service level agreements to action 100% of national minimum wage complaints that come through within five days, I think it is. So when these complaints come through, it could be something as simple as, you know, I never got paid last week. I didn't get paid for my pay last week. And if they look at that and they kind of triage that call and it opens an investigation, it opens an investigation on the entire business. So you could have wow. ten you could have ten thousand workers, but one person's just had, you know, some sort of kind of spurious underpayment that 
quite rightly, they deserve back they complained about, but it opens up the floodgates on this entire investigation. And when HMRC open an investigation, particularly on larger businesses, they can be there for three and four years and they can kind of delve very deeply in these things. And not, not only have you then got the kind of issue around penalties and naming, but it's just the, it's the time and resource that it takes yeah, HR sure. professionals, payroll professionals to actually deal with this as well. So that's kind of the most concerning, but I suppose maybe for uh, businesses is not the fact that they're, they're in the areas and they're probably opening cases in these specific areas, but that they're contacting so many workers and they're kind of nudging them towards, have a think about your pay, have a think about, have you worked through breaks? Have you been unpaid for this working time? Have you had a, dedu a deduction for something else? And it's getting the kind of getting the mind ticking over um, for that. And, you know, that can very easily lead to, you know, a big, big burden for employers going forward. Well, it sounds like the HMRC are going to need those 500 people on the ground for selling out 30,000. <laughs> exactly. exactly. But a, you know, we all know the cynic in me says there's a big hole in the, in the public coffers. They need to fill them. Let's go and hit the big accounts and see what comes back. Maybe, maybe not. I, I know that um, there are a lot of common challenges as well when it comes to national minimum wage. I know that, you know, when I, when I host payroll question time, there's certainly a lot of confusion around national minimum wage and the national living wage, for example. What are some of the, the common pitfalls, common challenges that you that you come across when you're working with your clients? Yeah, so I'll, just, I'll touch on that uh, when you mentioned there about national minimum wage, national living wage really quickly, because I think I remember there was a run of at least 30 webinars that I did when I was in HMRC that the, one of the first questions was always, What's the difference between national minimum yeah. wage and national living wage? It's always like just covering that one straight away. And it's very, very simply that the national living wage is just the name for the rate for those aged 23 and over. Um, so when it got introduced, there was a lot of confusion because you had the real living wage, the national living wage, the national minimum wage, et cetera, et cetera. So for, yeah, minimum wage purposes, just for anybody who maybe doesn't know, is you've got the five different minimum wage rates and the highest one is just for those aged 23 and over and that's just called it's just branded as the national living wage still all right. under the exact same legislation still kind of covered by the same rules um but that's, that's always one i feel is always worthwhile covering because i take it for granted so much that it's sure. dead straightforward yeah. but so many people do ask the question in terms of the kind of most common challenges that are, that are facing businesses just now the main risk that exists they tend to be fairly consistent and, and sometimes they have new ways of kind of displaying themselves in the real world, but they tend to come down to, and I'll, I'll, do, a, I'll do a chart-like countdown for you just now, but the, the top right. one, number one is always, always around unpaid working time. That's a really, really broad term, unpaid working time. It covers a lot of things, but it does come up time and time again. Probably the most common one is just those small kind of slivers of time before and after a shift. Now, the, the very, very basic broad brush rule that I like to give on this is any time where an employer requires a worker to be somewhere or requires them to be doing something, they're generally working for national minimum wage purposes. So if I work maybe in a shop and I start at 9 a.m., but they tell me I need to come in at night, sorry, at 10 to 9 to kind of open up, get things prepared, clock in, sign in, whatever else, that 10 minutes should also be included as working time back end of the shift i need to go through a security check on the way out to make sure i've not nicked anything from the factory uh, i need to change out of ppe or change out of equipment or i need to do any sort of handover with staff coming in again if there's a requirement for me to be there or doing something then it's going to count towards my working time in that day and that's one you know we, we're dealing with you know clients every day where that's still kind of coming up as an issue changing time before and after shifts having to just be somewhere to clock in and it can be just a couple of minutes and it's amazing how quickly it all adds up so even if you're just asking somebody to clock in and they have to clock in on a computer but they have to queue up to clock in so that takes them five minutes to queue up and clock in and everything you might think that the natural thing to say is like, so, so a couple of minutes doesn't matter you know it's it's fine a few minutes here a few minutes there but we did, I think we did some exercises and the, the figures here aren't going to be exact by any stretch of the imagination, but five minutes before and after a shift for somebody in minimum wage over five days a week, extrapolated over the six years that HMRC can go back on these things for a workforce of 5,000 people. So we say everybody's affected in the same way on minimum wage. 
works out at a charge of £37 million for that, that business when you're taking into account underpayments and penalties. So wow. the, yeah. the figures can get pretty wild pretty quickly when you're taking that over a large workforce. And those things you think is just such a simple kind of not really bothering too much about it, a few minutes here and there, does very quickly add up. And HMRC do enforce on that. I just did a really quick calculation. You mentioned two, uh, queuing for two minutes, two minutes a day, we call it 15 minutes a week. It's 12 hours a year. Yeah, and it, exactly, yeah. exactly. And, oh, and, and it's very easy to overlook the kind of seriousness of it when you think it's only a couple of minutes here and there. But again, I, I always come back to the, the kind of thought that there's always people at the end of these numbers and at the end of these decisions. And for something that's on minimum wage, you know, 10, 11, 12 hours is best part of 100 quid, 120 quid. And that, can be a big big difference maker yeah. for a lot of people and um, so that comes up a lot on you know top of that for unpaid working time things like training time if you're required to do training when you start working somewhere a lot of employers kind of do unpaid training whether it's a couple of days or a couple of weeks and um, any studying time particularly for those that are apprentices in uh, a workplace or in a, a business time spent training, time spent studying, time spent traveling as well in connection with work. So it's all of these different things that you don't immediately think of as work because they're maybe not carrying out the role there and then. But I always go back to that. If they're required to be somewhere or required to be doing something, it's likely that that's working time for minimum wage purposes. How, well, what is the, um, the confusion? Or the... We're in a new world of work hybrid working, people working from home, people now taking a call, for example, after hours from a boss or the fact they need to be there for that call that comes at eight o'clock or they need to handle something. How do you how do you navigate those kind of new considerations? I know mean, they were there before, but obviously more on mass now with those kind of considerations. Yeah, definitely. And um, I think what, what one of the challenges we're dealing with just now and one of the kind of big risks we're dealing with just now, if you're maybe talking about somebody who is kind of an office worker they're working from home a couple of days a week, they're taking calls, they're checking emails into the night and everything like that. First thing to kind of break up here is that there's different types of worker for minimum wage purposes, which which makes something that's already complicated even more complicated, so I'm probably not helping much. But the main two that we deal with are those called time workers, and that's somebody who's got an hourly rate of pay, they're paid that hourly rate of pay for each hour that they work in a pay period, and then salaried workers so they're given an annual salary. They've got on their contract ascertainable annualised hours. So that would be breaking down the weekly hours, monthly hours, etc. And they're paid a salary, a basic annual salary on the back of that. The rules are slightly different from those, those two types of workers. So one of the big risks that we're dealing with at the moment, and just to touch on that because you've kind of prompted it there, is on excess hours for those that are working as salaried workers. So you're getting a lot of contracts for people on salaries. And I've got it in my contract as well. And, you know, you're, you're contracted to work 35 hours a week, but you may be required to work additional hours unpaid as and when the business needs you, which is you know, absolutely fine. That unpaid working time, if you're a salaried worker, so you're on a salary, you try to think of it more as this, this is an annual thing rather than a month by month thing. So you've got your annual basic hours and you've got your annual pay. So let's just say for complete argument's sake, I have annual hours of 1,000 hours a year. So my annual basic hours are 1,000 hours a year. That's great if my salary's tied up to that and I work 1,000 hours over the course of the year. But if I hit that 1,000 hours, because I'm doing additional hours through the weeks, through the months, if I hit that 1,000 hours before the end of my contractual year, I'm then working excess hours. I'm working additional unpaid excess hours and HMRC don't calculate that the way you would expect them to. Say if I was if I was lucky enough to be paid four grand a month or whatever it is, say four grand a month, and you think, well, I've worked 20 additional hours in one particular month. Well, that's great. I've got four grand here, so I'm never going to come under the minimum wage because I've got so much leeway within that month. Yeah. But in actuality, HMRC look at it annually. So it then becomes a, a conversation of when I hit my annual hours, so let's say for argument's sake, I hit my 1,000 hours, but I hit it at the end of month 11, right at the end of my 11th month. So month 12 is sitting there. 
I've worked all of my annual hours that I've agreed to work in my contract, all my basic annual hours. So any hours that I actually work within month 12 are what we're calling excess hours. And they're essentially kind of unpaid excess hours at that point. So then as an employer, the way that HMRC calculate this to kind of make it as simplistic as possible, what you need to then ensure is that in month 12, the person's paid at least the minimum wage, not That's only wage. for their, yeah, exactly. Not only for their contracted hours, so not only for what I'm contracted to work in that month, but for any hours that I actually do work because those are all excess hours. Excess. So you can very easily, and we've got loads of kind of examples and calculations if anybody wants to follow up with us, where people on 35K and 40K a year, just due to the fact that they're working excess hours through the year, can be underpaid the minimum wage. And when I'm talking about HMRC, kind of expanding their enforcement and looking at larger businesses, they're also looking at sectors that you wouldn't expect them to look at for exactly this risk. They're looking at office workers, people who don't usually come into that, you know, quote unquote, low paid, high risk national minimum wage area. Uh, and that's where we are seeing spotlights just now. That's where we are seeing clients being questioned and having, you know, records taken away um, around that specific risk. It's a hard risk to explain. It's a complex one because the calculation isn't the way you would logically do it, but it's the way HMRC do it. And that's where we are seeing a lot of dropped jaws from, from employers and clients at the moment. Yeah, I'd say fair play because I think you've explained that really well. Oh, certainly, it, the, the, it's dropped for me. I understand it. Um, yeah. I was with you at the, to the end there. So I think you've, you've done that. Done it's, that about really, really the, well. it's about the 50th time I've tried to explain it in the last month. Yeah. So it's getting better and we're better each good. time. You should have heard the first couple of takes, but we're getting there with it. Well, I, saw, I saw a post that you put on LinkedIn again, which was talking about um, seeing some of your clients be genuinely wide-eyed, jaw-drop reactions when you try yeah. to explain the complexities and the risks around excess hours for salaried workers. And I think you've just kind of covered that really, really well. So I'm glad I, I'm glad I asked the... Uh, the question because it's not easy um, yeah. to understand but with with, with new um 2023 national minimum wage rates being introduced um i think i've seen a lot of clients starting to get nudge letters we had some of those uh conversations come up on payroll question time as well what are the most common inquiries you're now dealing with in relation to the new rates the new rates are really interesting because it's the biggest jump that there's been in a kind of year on year rate it's i mean the national living wage rate's gone up almost 10 percent and what that's then doing, I think I was looking at the Low Pay Commission for 2022, and they'd reckoned that in the last year, before these even these rates had even been taken into consideration, that there's 100,000 more workers have been underpaid the minimum wage than the year prior. Wow. So what it looks like, <laughs> it's, a it's a lot of people, but interestingly, what it looks like is happening is, so they talk about the coverage of national minimum wage pay, and what they mean by that is the population of the country who are paid at or very, very close to the minimum wage so they reckoned that there was around 2 million people in that set. But in the last year, it dropped to 1.5 million. So it's this kind of weird condensed population. So the population of people on minimum wage is dropping, but a higher percentage of that population are actually being underpaid. So I suppose the big issue is those that are kind of there or thereabouts on the minimum wage, they're being paid a lot more tightly to it. There's a lot less wiggle room because the rates themselves are going up at such sharp rates. So maybe employers who used to be able to pay, you know, 10p or 20p higher than the minimum wage and afford it are now at a position where they can't do that because the rates at the level that it's at. So there's just there's so much less wiggle room. And that's where these things like unpaid working time, like deductions for things like uniforms or tools or equipment, or even literally deductions for admin fees when you're maybe taking off, you know, court order costs or anything like that, even like one pound or two pound admin fee deductions, when somebody's dead on the minimum wage and you've not got that wiggle room can lead to an underpayment. So that's, I think that's one of the biggest complexities and biggest issues that companies have got just now is they've maybe had that wiggle room previously that they've been able to kind yeah. of not be as tightly strict on minimum wage measures as they have been. And now they've not really got that anymore. And I guess for those employers, they probably lost a little bit of their, you know, they've, they've probably seen themselves being quite an attractive employer because they were going 20p, 30p over, right? And now they've lost that competitive edge as well. But were you shocked then by the the, the size of, I mean, you've got that inside intel from working there mm -hmm. as well. Were you shocked by the size of the, the increase? And is it actually just been a, a, a rebalancing? Like you get in the stock markets every so often, they rebalance. And you know what? 
this has been out for some time. We need to just rebalance yeah. it. You know, I don't know. I think as well, like this is this is me just kind of um, talking personally, not having any sort of inside insight yeah. on it. But with the the way things are in terms of living costs and the prices for everything going up, I think it was I think it was pretty clear. You know, getting towards the tail end of last year before it was announced that it was going to have to be a decent sized rise just to make sure people weren't getting plunged into even worse positions uh, financially. You know, I think I think the plan was always to have it up round about that. I might be miles off here, but round about that kind of eleven pounds number um, by twenty twenty four. So it was almost as you said, just realigning that, especially after the pandemic and everything, where particularly national minimum wage enforcement and a lot of work around national minimum wage almost came to a standstill for a while. Yeah, it was a lot of realigning there. But yeah, no, I, I think the, the low low pay commission. I'll go back to that again. Was talking about the rates going up so much, but relative to everything else in life and how much everything else costs in life they weren't really so it is almost just kind of trying to keep people's head above water with that rate rise more than anything else yeah no that makes sense so from your perspective if you were either helping the payroll listeners on the on the show the payroll managers that listen in or, or even employers uh, entrepreneurs uh, if you were to give them some advice relating to national minimum wage to help them get things right yeah would it be there's a couple of things, a um, couple of really important ones. The, the first one I always go back to with employers is around just making life as easy for yourself as possible by keeping robust records and having good kind of record keeping practice. When I go back to that excess hours risk, one of the biggest issues around that is if HMRC come calling and start asking for time and attendance records, particularly for salaried staff, a lot of businesses don't keep them. If you've, you're paid a salary, you're paid for 37 and a half hours a week, you're probably not keeping records of every additional hour, every additional minute that you actually work. And straight away, that's creating problems. If HMRC are investigating you at that point, they then look to all manner of kind of different insights to put together someone's working week. So if there's no timesheet available, they can look at CCTV, they can look at your computers and your kind of log in, log out details. They interview workers, they can speak to hundreds of workers across a workforce as well. And they put together that picture of what someone they they would think is working in the week. And if they reckon that you're working an extra four hours a week and they've got evidence to back that up, they can extrapolate that across an entire workforce and then you can end up with a pretty hefty bill based on just whatever evidence they've been able to kind of pull together on that. The way to get away from that and the way to protect yourself against that is just to keep the records in the first place. So, you know, even for those salaried staff, for your time working staff who are clocking in and clocking out every day, it's just being as robust as you can uh, in record keeping. The HMRC are quite uh, helpfully very woolly about this in the, the legislation. So the, the legislation, I think, just says you have to keep records that are sufficient to show that you pay minimum wage. Now, that can mean so many different yeah. things for so many different businesses. So I suppose it might be a case of kind of sitting down as a business and figuring out what the best way to do that is and to be able to properly show that you're paying the minimum wage. Obviously, things like pay slips uh, for a starter are, are an absolute must, but things like timesheets, logging in, logging out details, recording excess and additional hours for your salaried staff as well, and just kind of taking that little bit of an extra administrative burden on, it might be a bit of a, a pain to do at the moment, but in the long term, it could end up being very helpful and be the difference between a big hefty HMRC bill and penalty and, and a not so bad one or not one at all. So it's very much worth doing that. Um, the, another kind of bit of advice is a very general one, but don't kind of fall into the trap of just thinking that everything's okay because you pay a rate at or above the national minimum wage. I've, I've kind of lost count of how many times I've you know, spoken to an employer and I've just got the, you know, oh, no, everything's absolutely fine. We pay £9.50 an hour. Everybody's, there's no problems with minimum wage. And then you lift the bonnet up and, and kind of take a look under and you see all these other risks. As we mentioned, things about unpaid working time, things yeah. around different types of deductions, even things around kind of apprentices and accommodation provided are the other key ones as well. So it's, it's not, don't just kind of fall into a trap, I suppose, of, uh, false security and thinking that just because your rate looks pretty attractive or it's above minimum wage, that everything's okay. You know, as, as we discussed five, 10 minutes ago, even somebody in £35,000, £40,000 a year 
can be technically underpaid. So it's just about kind of scrutinising your, your working practices, having a look at all these different risks uh, and common errors and finding out if and where they might kind of fit into your business as well. And if you do find issues, if you find something's gone wrong, be proactive about it. Be proactive about putting it right. And the, the big reason there is if you find a national minimum wage underpayment for any of your staff, but it's outside of an HMRC investigation, so you're not under investigation, if you put that right, you won't be liable to any penalties. You won't be liable for any public naming. Even if HMRC come out next year, investigate you and you say, yep, we found this problem. We put it right before you got in touch. It's sorted now and it's sorted going forward you won't be liable for penalties or public naming. So there is that window of opportunity to do that and put things right before it potentially becomes an issue. I'm going to ask, a, <laughs> might be a silly question, right? But it, it's popped up into my head. And I thought, you know what? We're talking a lot about the liabilities on the employers here, the investigations, HMRC potentially making um, assumptions if you don't keep that data. And maybe this hasn't, you said, you know, there's many, very few problems you haven't come across when you've done it for a long time. What about the other way around? If an employee gets a letter, they write back to HMRC saying, I think I've been underpaid. The HMRC comes in, starts the investigation. And for that particular worker, which I'm assuming is where they'd start, um, they discover that the person has been doing extra hours. But actually, in their investigation, they've discovered that the same employee has spent four hours of their working day on Amazon or any other website and not actually doing the work that they should be doing. Is that ever taken into consideration? Has it ever gone the other way? I'm just, yeah. well, maybe it hasn't, but I'm just it's, interested it's, to know. It's funny, that is, that's a kind of point of consternation that I, I can always remember having. And when you were getting kind of canvassing rounds for information from a lot of um, bodies, you know, a lot of employment bodies and everything, and what was coming back was, yeah, you know, people do make complaints, but sometimes the complaints are wrong or they're, they're just not informed or they're nonsense. And that does happen. I think only something along the lines of 40 to 45% of the investigations at HMRC Open actually come out with national minimum wage underpayments and issues at the other end. And that's that's obviously a lot of the support that we do um, at EY for employers because we, we are kind of scrutinising, uh, as I would say, what, what HMRC's maybe opinions are or what they might think is working time, uh, you know, against what's actually happening. So what you kind of get from employers, and, and I totally understand this, is there's a big administrative and there's a big kind of resource burden on a national minimum wage investigation being opened on you. You've got a lot of kind of deadlines to hit, a lot of information that you need to pass back and forward with HMRC, a lot of time on calls and meetings. And yeah, for at least half of them, it all just comes to, to not. You're just told we couldn't find any national minimum wage failings or based on the information that we've got, you don't seem to be underpaying the minimum wage. The case is closed. We may come back out if there's any information to kind of suggest otherwise in the future. So, yeah, I, I do get that's a point of frustration for businesses where they maybe know that it's fine or somebody's made a complaint. The person's known to them. It's been a dispute the HMRC have just been dragged into and yeah. they kind of they kind of know that they're being dragged into an investigation for their entire business now based on maybe what could be a a personal gripe or, or, or something that's happened long before that investigation. So, yeah, it is about, as I said, 40% of them do result in underpayments. So it is quite common that we go through that whole process with HMRC and they, they come out at the end of it with nothing. Fantastic. And I guess one question I need to ask for the listeners out there. Let's see, you mentioned if you're proactive, you can avoid some of the liabilities that come, you know, with the public shaming and things. I'm a payroll manager and I think I've identified a problem um you know potentially we're, we're not meeting our, our, our national wage obligations what would be the next step you would recommend they took is it coming to someone like yourself at ey is it going straight to hmrc is there a different course of action yeah well the, the, the funny thing is if you identify an underpayment you're under no legal obligation to contact the hmrc and tell them about it until <laughs> or unless they open an investigation on you so you know, we often think, you know, if, if there was an underpayment or an area where you'd found potential risks and you highlighted that to HMRC, this is me just personally speaking, but you could be putting yourself under the microscope a little bit and yeah, sure, kind of sure. inviting on some unwanted scrutiny at that point. Obviously, being at EY, you know, the, the, the kind of bread and butter of what I'm doing now is supporting in that space where employers and clients are contacting us and saying you know we think we've found a potential issue here we think there might be something wrong here can you take a look at it 
what we would do is we can take a very broad look at the business itself. We can spend some time with the business, looking at what the common risks are, where these risks and issues might crop up. We can look at the kind of documentation. Sometimes that's reviewing their contracts, reviewing their pay and attendance um, records and the, the methodology that they put into that. And then just having that kind of honest and frank conversation with them about, you know, here's where your risks are, here's what your liability likely is, and here's how you can go about making the repayments to people as well. And we can kind of talk them through that process as well. So it's it's almost like being part of the, the HMRC investigation, which is why I've hopefully, you know, kind of feel I've taken to it so well, because it is quite similar, but it's a lot more collaborative and it's a lot more transparent and genuinely helpful and the conversations are a lot more kind of productive as well. You are trying to put things right. Because as I said, you know, kind of to a man, every every employer that I've dealt with do genuinely want to pay their workers what they should be paying their workers, but they do just feel in a lot of cases there are so many blockers and, you know, definitely... Yeah, payroll's it, complex, yeah, right? Yeah, exactly. Know, there's yeah, know, loads of things going on. I think what's quite nice, though, is... Is they can, you know, if they were to come to someone like yourself, right? It, for me, it'd be a comfort blanket knowing that I'm dealing with people that, whether it's yourself, whether it's Jenny, whether it's your team, high chance you've, you've worked the other side of the fence. So you understand mm. the inner workings and therefore can probably help them guide them through without without having to, as you say, invite scrutiny. Yeah, and that's, that's the big thing. And I don't, don't want to start sounding like I'm shilling now, but that's the big thing that I think really kind of sets our team apart as well is all three of us in the kind of dedicated national minimum wage team, we've got. 25 plus years of national minimum wage experience between the three of us and that's split between hmrc and ey as well and um, i did as i said i was a caseworker and did a lot of the employer engagement and education uh steven and my team as well was also a trainer so he was literally training up the compliance officers and telling them how to approach cases and how to work cases so that's kind of an added facet of it as well we know the legislation we know how to implement it and we know how to give employers advice but we also know when it's part of an investigation the kind of ways that hmrc approach the investigations and we can almost kind of act as that bridge between the the client and hmrc and really facilitate the conversations and make things run a lot smoother because sometimes you do just get complete breakdowns in communications people aren't taking things as they're meant to be taking them and you know these conversations are never difficult if somebody feels that they're getting you know investigated by hmrc and the walls can go up and everything like that so we can kind of act as the 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 middleman there and and just kind of make things go as smoothly as possible as well for an employer very nice so for those interested by the way there will be some links in the show notes if you suddenly think actually i need to get in touch with someone like gary i've got an issue uh you'll be able to do that through the show notes i'll put gary's personal email on there for those who want to reach out to get to gary as well so do check the show notes for that uh last question before we open uh the vault gary which is this we talked a lot about national minimum wage but what's the best part for you you said you absolutely love it what's the most rewarding part of working in national minimum wage uh particularly i guess in, in now you're ey i don't yeah. know what you're Okay, I'll give you a, I'll give you one personal highlight from when I was at HMRC, um, and it was a bit of a silly one. So I got I got made fun of uh, quite a lot for it. But um, I had one worker who worked at a car park and wasn't getting paid properly. His employer was calling him self-employed. He wasn't self-employed. He was a worker, so his pay rate was nowhere near enough. And I think I got him back like seven or eight thousand pounds. And um, he wrote a letter to the Queen. He wrote to Buckingham Palace to talk about me and how we got him the money and everything like that. So um, I got Love a letter that. came into the office one day, and it was a it was a letter with the royal seal on it. And my manager and the rest of the team were all panicking because they were thinking, "What have you done? Why is Buckingham Palace writing to us?" And we opened up, and it was a letter of thank you from Buckingham Palace for like there for, you sort, go. for sorting this guy's national minimum wage. This is why you're known so, as the voice of national minimum wage. I know, I know. So it's it's stuff like that that you, you kind of maybe don't get in other facets of tax and employment tax and everything where. There is such a personal touch to it. You're dealing with people, whether it's the worker or whether it is, you know, I've, I've met so many nice people that work in payroll and HR. And because national minimum wage is so niche, you do feel so appreciated in bringing your kind of knowledge and bringing your experience along it and genuinely making life a little bit easier for them because I know how stumped people can be and how wound up people can get about the national minimum wage when it's not something they deal with day to day. I get wound up about it and I deal with it every single day. So I know how difficult yeah. it can be for people. So it, it's just really nice, kind of just from a personal level, being of genuine value to people or, or actually making people's day a little bit better, making them a little bit less stressed about this issue or this uh, enforcement case. You know, 
at, at EY, it's been brilliant so far. I'm only kind of three months in, but I've been, you know, pretty shocked at actually how friendly and how positive and how collaborative and you know how nice everybody's been and how, how kind of willing everybody is to to work with each other and actually try and I, I know the, the EY logo is you know a better working world but there is there's kind of so much truth to that as well so I've been loving that side of it so far but yeah it's just a really kind of cool area to work in it's always interesting kind of two days two inquiries are never the same uh, I'm yeah. always going back and kind of double checking guidance and triple checking advice because everything is so kind of up in the air sometimes so it's brilliant for that super interesting line of work and yeah really enjoying it and hopefully many many more years to come i think you've sold it really well and i'm you know i'm fortunate i'm I'm agnostic as well by the way for those listening but i know jenny morris and she's fantastic so yeah um you know you've got a great team there and i think you've sold the profession really well interestingly and not remotely uh, related to national minimum wage but when you started the car park attendant uh, story, it reminded me of a, I don't know if it's an old wives uh, tale, whether it's actually existed, but a guy was in a, one of the, the zoo car parks and came in with a parking meter and charged everyone every day. And it turned out the zoo didn't employ him. He just used to rock up. And I don't know if it was, I heard, so that was story, I'm but... sure I've seen that on Twitter recently as well. Yeah, it was doing yeah. the rounds as a meme or something, wasn't it? Yeah. That, listen, if, that, if that's how you want to make your money, as long as he's getting paid for every hour he's there, I'm quite happy. There you go. You're quite happy. <laughs> well, the good thing is, and, and you're absolutely right, you know, you, it's not just the employees who often on the breadline you're helping with that seven thousand or eight thousand pound that example you gave came back that could be life-changing for people but also mm. as a small business owner myself you want to get these things right because a big investigation actually could be the difference for us being able to run our business effectively as well yeah. and we want to get it right you know we've got we're employing people we want them to be employed in the right way we want them to be paid correctly and you don't want to have to suffer the the turmoil of going through an investigation when you think you've done everything right so you know it can really impact exactly. business performance so i think exactly really and, and that's you know just such a big a big thing that we do when we're supporting employers against their kind of national minimum wage hmrc investigations as well some employers i've seen stories where some employers have literally had to kind of cease trading or it has you know yeah. really affected their trading based on the kind of outcome of those national minimum wage investigations so it's it's obviously kind of using the the knowledge and the advice and the expertise that we've got is to, to make things as kind of manageable as possible for the, the person that's going through the investigation and helping them through that as well. Because being on both sides is a daunting thing. HMRC investigating you, scrutinising your payroll, scrutinising your records and interviewing your workers and your staff. It can be very daunting and very, very stressful. And sometimes it's just having that kind of, I suppose, that hand to hold from somebody that's been there before, seen it hundreds of times and can hopefully kind of walk you through it and make it a little bit easier for you. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, so we're going to open the vault. So three short, sharp questions. You've heard this before okay. in previous episodes. Uh, first one, interesting, because you're kind of working in the world of payroll, but not as a payroll professional, but I'll ask it anyway. One piece of advice you would give to someone who's working in payroll right now? Contact me at EY to talk about all things. <laughs> That's no matter what. That's way. Way. That's the yeah, perfect response. Yeah, exactly. I know very easy to think that everything's okay and everything's great and you pay rates above minimum wage but though i will almost always guarantee that there's something that we can talk to you about and something we can help you with yeah nice nice if you had the power of foresight and could change the entire payroll industry with one action or improvement what would that action or improvement be <laughs> from a minimum wage perspective far more robust time and attendance records yeah. record I would keeping just, I thought, yeah record keeping robustness good practice around that would alleviate so many issues Super. I'm going to change the word pearl to national wage here. So if national minimum wage was a song or a movie, what song or movie would it be and why? Oh, God. I was going to say the Shawshank Redemption, uh, just based on my escape from HMRC, but I don't, <laughs> want, to, I don't want to leave a bad taste in the mouth with HMRC there. But yeah, that was the first one that came to mind. <laughs> Perfect. Well, I'm conscious of time. Otherwise, I, I, I'm, a, I'm a bit glad I didn't get a chance to talk to you about your golfing. For those who are into golf, this man here play, used to play off a handicap of three, a very talented uh, Scottish <laughs> golfer uh, when he has the time to play. And unfortunately, we've kind of run out of time there. But if anyone's after a round of golf, Gary's the man you want to you be playing alongside. More, more, absolute... than, more than willing to have business meetings in the golf course as well, if anybody's interested. Yeah, you and me both. I'll put my email <laughs> in, in the show notes. You can contact both of us if you're interested in doing that. Um, but listen, it's been really uh, good with us to stop talking about national minimum wage. It's a complex area. I think you've articulated and helped us navigate it really really well gary so i really do appreciate your time i will of course put links to 
the services EY provide to to Gary's personal email address um, and also to Gary's LinkedIn profile as well for those of you listening that want to connect. Uh, there's also a really good study um, by EY, which I'll put into the show notes, which is called Worldwide Doing Payroll Guide. Uh, so we'll take a look at that as well if you're interested in other services that they provide. Obviously, EY uh, provide a number of services um, over and above just national minimum wage uh, in relation to payroll as well. And of course, if you are a payroll leader listening to this show and you need support with a payroll recruitment related vacancy, well, that's my expertise. So do get in touch with myself or any of my wonderful team at jjrecruitment.com. Uh, and finally, that link will also be in the show notes. So, Gary, huge thank you, uh, the voice of national minimum wage, for joining me today on the payroll podcast. And I look forward to bringing you the next episode real soon. Thanks, Gary. Cheers.